What are the main side effects of an autologous stem cell transplant? What are the acute toxicities of transplant? Um, so just a refresher. So, you know, when we do a transplant, you know, what the, what the real treatment is, is the, is the chemo. It's the melphalan. <clears throat> so the melphalan is, is what we call the conditioning agent, but really the melphalan is the drug that's killing the cancer cells. But unfortunately, it has a side effect of killing all the good cells too. And so that's why we have to do the stem cell transplant, the, the infusion of stem cells to allow you to recover, to allow someone to recover from the chemo. So it's almost like a stem cell rescue, and that's what they used to call it many years ago. Um, so the side effects you get from a transplant are really from the melphalan. And the most common side effects really occur in the first few weeks after a transplant, typically weeks, you know, one, two, and three after infusion of the stem cells. So the most common side effects, I think the big one that I think we sometimes don't talk about enough is fatigue. Fatigue is a really big issue with the transplant. It's just hard to get up, hard to get up and do things, hard to have that get up and go energy. That typically gets better after two to three weeks, but sometimes it can stay for a little bit longer. Sometimes people have fatigue that lasts longer than a month, maybe even longer than two months. And the key with the fatigue is just trying to do as much as you can, trying to stay active, trying to, to walk, trying to get up. Because unfortunately, when you don't do things, it sort of becomes a perpetuating cycle where you, if you're in bed all day, then you're gonna keep staying in bed all day. So you have to kind of, there's an element of sort of, you know, trying to get up, but certainly if you need rest, you need rest. So fatigue is a big one. The other big one that I typically counsel patients on are the gastrointestinal side effects. So the nausea, sometimes severe vomiting, intractable vomiting sometimes, and diarrhea. And why is this happening? It's so the three organs that, uh, that typically are most affected by the melphalan when we give high doses of it are one, the bone marrow. So that's why the, we, people become immunosuppressed. Two, the gut. So the gut cells are really sensitive to the melphalan. And so it causes those cells to die. And that's what why people get sick. This word sometimes you might hear your doctor use is mucositis. Mucositis can happen not just in the mouth, but also can happen farther down. And that's, you know, that irritation is what causes the nausea and the vomiting. How we deal with that sometimes if it's, we, you, you might get several medications to help suppress the nausea. Sometimes we might have to admit patients to the hospital if they can't eat at our center. We do commonly admit people if they can't eat and we often might give nutrition in through an IV to help support someone because we, it's not good when you're not feeling well and you've just had high doses of chemo, it's not good to not eat for several days. So we have to make sure we give people nutrition. We have to make sure we get their nausea under control because it feels, it doesn't feel good. It is a very self-limited thing though. Typically the recovery of the nausea and the mucositis symptoms and the diarrhea happens around the time the stem cells start to what we call engraft. And the engraftment just means that's when the new immune system has taken hold and started producing the immune cells that help heal the damage in the gut. And so when that happens, people start feeling better. Sometimes it can last a little bit longer than that, particularly the diarrhea, but for the most part, the symptoms get better after like three to four weeks. Um, the mouth sores, that's another manifestation of muc mucositis. And if you've ever had a canker sore, it's similar, but it's much worse. We have found that using um, ice chips, having folks suck on ice chips during the melphalan helps reduce how much you get in your mouth because we're limiting blood flow to those areas. So they don't get as much melphalan, but, but certainly you can still get mucositis even if we use the ice chips. And the management for that, I mean, that, 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 that becomes a pain issue. And so we have to use pain medications. Sometimes we have to use pain pumps to help get folks get through that. But that also gets better around the time that the other GI symptoms do. Um, hair loss is really common. You know, the, the cells that make our hair are really sensitive to that chemo. And so when we, when we, when patients receive that chemo, it causes hair to fall out. So it's pretty normal to, to have hair loss. Sometimes people just decide to shave their heads before undergoing the, the transplant. Um, or when the hair starts to fall out because it can be very distressing for obvious reasons. But just remember, it's a temporary side effect your hair will come back um, and it takes a while, but your pe people's hair does 
does come back. That's that's um, expected. The other common toxicity that people can get is this related to the, the when we give the chemo or wiping out the normal immune system. And so that really, you know, what we're do, we're wiping out all of the normal defenders against bacteria, viruses, etc. And so there's a risk of infections. So infections are, are a very common reason for people to be admitted after getting chemotherapy of, of, of the mouthful for the transplant. And the most common way that would manifest would be what we call a neutropenic fever, which is where you get a fever while you have no neutrophils. And neutrophils are those spider white cells that help get rid of bacteria. Um, and so when, we, when people get a neutropenic fever, we usually give them antibiotics um, just to prevent things from getting worse because without an immune system, if you even have just a simple bacterial infection, that can become a big problem. People can become very sick uh, very quickly. So we have to get on top of that quickly. The other thing that folks might need is blood or platelet transfusions. If the red blood cells are too low or if the platelets are too low because you know having low platelets can pre predispose to bleeding. Um, but these, like the GI toxicities, do get better within two to three weeks once patients engraft. So those are kind of the short-term toxicities. Long-term toxicities really are, are, are sort of, you know, less about how you feel, but more about what the melphalan can do to your body and sort of the second, the side effects of that. So one of them that we commonly counsel patients on is secondary malignancies. So for people who get a melphalan transplant and get lenalidomide for maintenance, there is a probably six to 8% risk of a secondary malignancy down the road. Now, most of those are solid tumors. Many of those are skin cancers. There's a, there is a risk of getting what we call a secondary myeloid neoplasm. The risk of that is lower than six to 8%, but those are, those are important for patients to be counseled about. Um, there's also a risk of, of earlier cataract formation and, um, and th endocrine abnormalities as well that we have to monitor people for long-term. You know, melphalan isn't toxic to the heart. There are other ways of giving transplant that combine drugs, like for lymphoma, we sometimes give a chemo regimen called BEAM, and that has a drug in it that can affect the heart. Um, but typically, you know, cardiac abnormalities are not, you know, among the things that we are more concerned about after a transplant. It doesn't mean that there's not probably some risk of cardiovascular disease after stem cell transplant, but uh, it's, not, um, it's not something that I typically call out. So the main side effects of transplant are hair loss, which typically happens about uh, two weeks after the melphalan is administered. The main other toxicity of melphalan is it damages the intestine. Um, so diarrhea, nausea, uh, decreased appetite. Um, those are the uh, main uh, complications. Uh, there's also uh, mucositis, which is inflammation of the mouth. Uh, now, that is typically managed by eating ice chips while the melphalan is being infused. That makes the mouth very cold. It decreases the delivery of melphalan to the oral tissues and protects the mouth from um, developing sores. But there's no way of doing that for the rest of the intestine, so people do have uh, those side effects. Or most of the time, it's very mild. Um, they just Patients don't want to eat very much. Um, so their appetite drops considerably, but they can be supported with IV fluids. The diarrhea can be managed with uh, anti-motility agents like Imodium or Lamotil. Uh, sometimes we have to give uh, some stronger drugs, but most people can manage with that where they're going maybe once to twice a day. Um, and the IV fluids helps them get through the rest of the procedure and the side effects.